Yeah, they're they're big files. Yes. <laughs> so cloud is a good idea. Okay, here we go. Now we have Evelyn. Hi, Evelyn. Hey, hi, Evelyn. Well, I just want to thank you, first of all, for giving me the opportunity. I, I love talking about pollinators. It's um, something that I think is really important. And I'm always so happy when I hear of interest in this topic, because it really is important. Um, so my name is Amy Sybil. Um, I mentioned earlier, I'm teaching faculty in the School of Biological Sciences. My flagship course that I teach in the spring is conservation biology. My background is in um, the conservation of pollinators, um, plant ecology, that kind of stuff. Um, and I've been around for about 10 years. Quickly into my tenure here at the University of Utah, I was approached by a couple of students who wanted to start a beekeepers association at the university. And they came to me um, and I thought, well, I don't know as much about honeybees as they do about all the other kinds of bees and the pollination biology side of things, but why not? So I've been doing that since 2012 and really loving it. We do keep honeybee hives around campus, not only to teach folks about how to keep bees, but also we use honeybees as kind of a gateway drug to talk about insects and pollinators in general. And it's a really effective way to do that. And then, um, Something really beautiful happened just last winter. I had uh, a group of students from my biology classes as well as uh, from the Beekeepers Association, and we pursued a national designation as a Bee Campus USA, um, which we were awarded in December. It was like a spot of good news in a really, really hard and challenging time during the pandemic. So um, we can now call the University of Utah a Bee Campus USA. We're the only one with that designation in the state of Utah though I've heard that Utah State University is pursuing that too. So there are lots of initiatives across campus that I've been working on and partnering with for about a decade now to try to build um, pollinator friendly habitat into our spaces. Um, so I'm loving talking to the housing folks and the, you know, the potential for expanding even more pollinator friendly habitat in those housing gardens. So I just love this. Um, you probably recognize this one bee here in the top right corner. That's a honeybee. That's what most people recognize. And when you hear the word bee, this is what most people picture is a honeybee. Um, but there are almost 20,000 other different species of bees in the world. And I'm going to talk a fair amount about those. Um, this one in the lower uh, right corner is called a carpenter bee. And you may have been seeing these they're the size or even bigger than bumblebees and this glossy black. Some of them have a little bit of yellow fuzz on their thorax, that middle part of their body, um, but they're big and they kind of buzz us. Um, and they've been pretty active the previous months. So you might've seen those around too. Um, and most people don't know what to call them. They think they're big wasps or flies, but they're actually carpenter bees and some really important pollinators as well. Um, I also should say, please interrupt me. Just, just talk okay, over good. me if you have a question. I have a question about the carpenter bees. Like, right. so those aren't like, you know, when you see a wasp, you think they're a little more aggressive. Are those like that? So there's a fun little secret when it comes to carpenter bees. The ones that tend to be obvious to humans because they're buzzing us, they're the males. They're kind of territorial and they will protect the, the females area where they're nesting, male bees, all male bees of all 20,000 species do not have stingers. They just what? don't. They don't have stingers. I did not know that. <laughs> yeah. And um, because stingers in bees kind of evolved with their reproductive parts and males don't have the right reproductive parts. So it's shocking. I yeah. So you, you don't have to be afraid of being stung at all. Um, and they will, carpenter bees, they're named because they'll drill little holes into kind of old aging soft wood. But they're not going to cause the kind of problems that say termites or carpenter ants will do where there's some big massive active colony year round. So they're carpenter bees, but they're just, they don't sting and they don't really cause that much damage. And so we can mostly just enjoy them. <laughs> um, I think the reason I, a lot of the public is, is really aware about bees is because of the honeybee, right? And we heard about colony collapse disorder starting in about 2006 
Um, but there's another species that's in the public, you know, insect species and pollinator that's in the public sphere right now, and that's the monarch. And you've probably heard that the monarchs are in decline. And so this is, it's really sad and troubling, but it's a good way to start talking about why we should care about insects, because these are two of the world's most common insects until now. <clears throat> and both of them have decreased rapidly and, and, and decidedly. And so I just wanted to talk a little bit about why, because I know I, you know, most people are curious about honeybees and monarchs and what's going on. Um, and then we'll spend the rest of the time just talking about the kinds of bees and other pollinators you'll find in your particular spaces and the kinds of habitat and plants you can provide for them. But this is kind of the 30,000 view first of you know, like what is going on in the world of insects by way of these two example species. Um, so the sad thing about honeybees is that um, starting in the 90s, really, we started seeing some declines and then really massive and stark declines in the early 2000s. And by 2006, again, we, we used, invented the term colony collapse disorder because um, commercial and hobbyist honeybee keepers were noticing that their hives just disappeared. They didn't even find carcasses, right? A, a healthy, normal sized honeybee hive in the middle of summer will have somewhere between 50 and 60,000 workers in it. And so if you if you expected some kind of poisoning or something had happened to the hive, you'd expect to see 50,000 dead carcasses of bees, but they weren't finding anything. They were just empty. Um, and so that was super worrying and, and uh, of unknown source. And over the last many years, we've realized that the cause of this isn't a single thing. It's a kind of synergistic uh, interactions among multiple stressors. And these can be applied to honeybees, they can be applied to a lot of other bee species and other insects as well. Um, the first big thing for honeybees specifically is um, a parasite called the Varroa mite, which is an invasive species that's not native to the Western Hemisphere. It's actually not, honeybees are not native to the Western Hemisphere either. We uh, Europeans brought them over in the early 1500s, specifically for keeping honey. Um, but the varroa mite evolved with the Asian honeybee species, which has um, these co-evolutionary adaptations to deal with the varroa mite. The European honeybee, which is the species that all of us keep as honeybees here in the Western um, Hemisphere, didn't co-evolve, don't have adaptations, and end up being decimated by the varroa mite, um, which not only, it's, it would be like us carrying a tick on our bodies, the size of like a dinner plate, sucking all the fat out of our body. Which, right, if you're trying to lose weight, that might sound good. <laughs> it'll kill you, right? Like it'll it'll kill you quickly. So, and it does cause direct death of bees. They are also nasty vectors of disease. The way mosquitoes carry things like dengue fever and yellow fever and malaria, varroa mites carry similarly nasty and devastating diseases um, that impact honeybees. So that's kind of like enemy number one, and it's really hard. We really struggle every year to figure out how to keep varroa mites out of our honeybee hives. Uh, unfortunately, last year, Utah, both commercial and hobbyist honeybee hives lost half of their hives, fully half. The majority of them, those losses were contributed to by these varroa mites and the diseases they spread. When you say lost, does it like they die or they leave? Dead. Okay, because my father-in-law has, has hives and sometimes they just disappear. Yeah, which also means they're dead. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, if your honeybees leave your hive empty, they're dead. Oh, okay. If your honeybees swarm, and you've probably heard about swarms, right? You'll see a swarm occasionally in a tree. That's some of a honeybee hive that's been overcrowded and they're starting a new colony, new but they don't leave the original hive empty. Okay, if that so makes if, they sense. Left it, if they leave it empty, it's, they're dead. They're dead. Okay. They, didn't, they didn't find their way back to that hive. Okay. Um, and it's really sad. Um, and they're, they're one of the, um, so one of the problems that causes that is number three here, pesticides. Uh, a little over a decade ago, the Bayer company, like the company that makes aspirin, also is just a chemical company. They invented um, a broad spectrum insecticide called neonicotinoid insecticide. 
And originally we thought, wow, this might be a really good thing for insects because you don't spray it on the plants and therefore you're not spraying it on the insects. The problem is that this insecticide is incorporated into the tissue of the plants, including the nectar and the pollen, which bees and all pollinators are eating. And so they end up dying of that directly, but this can also mess with a bee's homing ability, ability to navigate and find their way back to their nest or their hive. So your, uh, was it your father-in-law you were mentioning? Yeah, that may have been happening to these bees. They may have been exposed to neonicotinoids and it's sprayed, you know, it's, it's utilized in our agricultural crops and it's also included in some of our just gardening crops as well. Okay. So look for that. When you're buying plants and seeds at a nursery or Home Depot yeah. or whatever, look for that. Make sure they're neonicotinoid free. Um, and then there's all this kind of stuff, overcrowding and poor nutrition, because we collectively as a country ship almost 90% of our commercial honeybee hives all over the country all summer long to pollinate our industrial level crops. So you've probably heard in February, a million honeybee hives get shipped to California to pollinate the almond crops. I've seen those trucks, uh, you know, they're on I-15 heading to California. Kind of impressive, actually. They're, I mean, there are bees buzzing and they cover all of these hives on the back of a semi with a big net. And so you see bees buzzing around going 80 miles an hour down the highway. Like, clearly that's not so great for those <laughs> honeybees. And then they go from California to Florida to, to to deal with crops down Florida, like tomato crops. And then they get shipped up to Pennsylvania, Maine and New Jersey for the blueberry crops. And then they get shipped to the Midwest. So as you can imagine, it's stressful. They are forced to eat very specific crops. They are forced into these overcrowded situations and it diminishes their immune system's ability to deal with the onslaught of pesticides and varroa mites and diseases. And it's that also contributes to the decline and then we have this problem with, as a, as a country in general, getting our queen honeybees from just a few specific genetic lines. So when you want to keep bees for the first time, you'll buy bees. You'll like, they come in a three pound package of bees that you dump in a hive and they come with a queen that'll keep that hive intact and she'll start laying eggs and maintain it but only a few breeders sell these specific queens. So they end up basically um, inbreeding with each other. And, and you know what inbreeding causes, it causes recessive genes and mutations and variants that are detrimental to the continued survival. So yeah, as you can tell, just like this onslaught of nastiness for honeybees and then some of these also to regular bees. So, Kind of problematic, kind of kind of hard. We can do some things about this, and I'll talk about that. Sorry, um, one last question. Are yeah, you, please lay it on me. Is that in order of the most like? So your one through five is one the main thing, or is that just all random? Do you know what I mean? Yes. The yeah. Good question. And yes. Okay. So that is in order of top one. Con okay. Yeah, contributing factors. So varroa mite, hands down, the biggest problem, and part of it is because we're having a really hard time figuring out how to control the varroa mite without also injuring the bees. Um, poor nutrition, we've created these monocultures in our agricultural systems where there's nothing to eat the one crop that we're forcing them to pollinate. And we don't generally in industrial agriculture, we're not growing other things underneath those trees or bushes or whatever, um, which and honeybees are generalists. That would be like forcing us humans to eat spaghetti three days a week every day of the week for you know months. It's fun maybe at first, but it's not good nutrition. We need balance. Um, and then the neonicotinoids, those are like the top three worst things for the honeybees. That's a good question. Any other uh, question? Okay, we'll keep going. So, okay, so the other one is the monarch, right? We know monarchs are good pollinators as well. We have heard in the news that they may be a candidate for listing under the Endangered Species Act in, in the near future. Um, and that's because um, there are, there's an onslaught of impact to, to their habitat as well. Um, they are not 
they're suffering from insecticides the way bees are, but they're not quite as bad. Their number one threat is a loss of habitat. And that's something we as gardeners really can help with because when I say habitat, I mean flowers. <laughs> and this specifically, I mean milkweed. You've probably heard that monarchs only um, lay their eggs on milkweeds. We have, you know, dozens and dozens of different species of milkweeds and many of them are beautiful, uh, you know, very decorative flowers and we can easily incorporate them into our garden spaces. Um, but they'll also feed on a few hundred different species of flowers as far as when they're adults sipping nectar out of the flowers. So just about any butterfly friendly flower will feed a monarch as well. So those are great things that we can do as gardeners. Um, the more troubling, there are two populations of monarchs in the United States. We call one the Eastern. They're the ones that overwinter in the pine forests of Mexico. Um, and then there's the Western population. They're the ones that overwinter on the coastal forests of California and Baja. Um, the Western population is almost extinct. Um, in the 1980s, if you went and did a survey of those overwintering monarchs, um, and I got to see them actually in 1990 on the coast of California, it was a stunning, miraculous thing to observe. Millions of monarchs draped on these branches of trees, um, coastal forests next to California. Um, again, they numbered, you know, four to five million in the 80s. The, the last survey that was just done this past winter, there were only 3,000 butterflies. And that's not enough to sustain this kind of species or population that relies on large numbers to avoid predators and that kind of stuff. So it'll likely go extinct in the next couple of years. The Eastern population is doing a little bit better. Um, and I'll show us a slide that shows the, the latest graph of that data. But um, I wanna talk about the main threats before I move on to that, because it is habitat. Um, and I talked about the things we can do like planting milkweeds and other butterfly friendly flowers. Um, but there's another thing we can do because their overwintering habitat is being destroyed as well. And that's contributing greatly. And one of the things is buying avocados from Mexico. Those pine forests in Michoacan, Mexico have been chopped down to build more and more acreage of avocado orchards. So pay attention to where you get your avocados from and reduce demand for avocados from Mexico, buy them from California and other places. Ironically, the California avocado groves don't conflict with the overwintering monarch um, forests there. Uh, insecticide use is another problem. Avoid that if you can or just have really targeted uses of it. Um, and then these are a migratory species and butterflies don't exactly present themselves in this sturdy physical <laughs> manifestation, right? They're butterflies, they seem so um, kind of uh, delicate. Uh, and as we mess with their migration corridors, um, building roads and chopping down, you know, native prairies and forests and covering it with highways and malls and parking lots, it is disrupting their migratory patterns. And then the big bugaboo over all of this is climate change. Uh, climate change is messing with, especially the, the, the pine forests of Mexico where they overwinter. So that's something we can all do, try to reduce our carbon footprint and not just the easy stuff, right? It's now it's time for us to start making those harder decisions. You know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna lease a new car, lease an electric one, or maybe sacrifice some of the material goods in our lives so that we can install a solar panel on our roof if we own a house, that kind of stuff. Not for those of you living in student housing, I know, but those will be decisions you make in your future lives. Um, and then here's just the last little bit about the Eastern monarch population, the ones that do overwinter in Mexico. They measure that instead of measuring it by the number of individual butterflies, they measure it by the, the acreage that it, they, they cover when they're overwintering. Um, let me just move that. Uh, and you can see that it's, it's kind of um, recovered a little bit from the low of just 1.5 six acres of butterflies that were in those forests in 2013. We're now holding at about five acres. Um, but we were hoping, and now I've switched to hectares here in these bullet points, but it's not quite at the level of, of butterfly numbers that we think will sustain the population enough over time. But there, the nice thing is that there are a lot of agreements and international um, 
uh, conversations going on to really be protective of these forests and to boost the population numbers. So they're in better shape than the Western population and I'm more hopeful that they will persist over time. Okay, any, any questions before um, I move on? Okay, I feel like I talked about this, milkweed, um, climate change, logging and deforestation of the pine forest in Mexico, insecticide use, these are the, the big things, um, really troubling monarchs. One thing I haven't mentioned was disease. We think because of all of these other stressors that monarchs are experiencing kind of a, a widespread uh, compromised immune system and that that's creating these kind of synergistic downward spiral. They're just not able to come back to the things that are normally in their environment anyway, viruses, fungus, and, and whatnot. Um, so yes, gardeners, plant your milkweeds. Let, any milkweed species you can find, and there are lots of them different colors, and, and, and a variety of them when you have the spaces. Also, poke them into random open spaces and parks and open spaces and along the Jordan River Trail, wherever, right? You can be like the rogue Johnny Appleseed, but with milkweeds. <laughs> um, I absolutely encourage that kind of rogue milkweed planting and do it myself. Um, and then, like I mentioned, be careful where your avocados come from. And also, I know in some cases we're told that, you know, well, maybe buying organic produce doesn't make a difference and it's too expensive and it doesn't increase nutritional value, blah, blah, blah. It makes a difference when it comes to killing insects. So when you can afford it, when you have the ability to make this choice, do vote with your dollars for sustainable agricultural practices. Um, I, it is important and it's beyond just the food itself. It's beyond the, you know, preventing the use of insecticide. It's, it's telling our industrial agricultural system, I care about regenerative and sustainable ag agricultural practices and I'm willing to put my money where my mouth is. So I, I really do think that's important. Um, and what I learned from these oh. the monarchs and honeybees, we learned that we can't just pay attention to the rare species. We can't ignore insects anymore. We have to have a, a broad view and pay attention before we get to the point where like the Western monarch population is going extinct, even though 40 years ago, there were 5 million of them, right? Yeah. So I'm gonna talk a lot about bees after this. Any questions? Uh, two questions. You said planting butterfly friendly flowers. Is there like a way, do we just Google what those are? Yeah, like there's, a, um, there's a fantastic resource. Um, they're the ones actually that designated U, U of U as a B Campus USA, the Xerces Society. And I, I have their website on the last slide here. Okay. Xerces.org. Okay. And then resources for that. They just came up with a new publication of the 200 best plants to put in your garden for butterflies. Oh, cool. So that's like, that's a really great new publication uh, to refer to. And then so. my last question, I sometimes see these yellow or like orange butterflies that I think are monarchs. Sometimes I've heard people be like, oh, that's like a moth or something. Like, are the yellow and orange butterflies monarchs? So uh, they're the the orange and black and white. Let me see if I can go up oh, here. Oh, they have so they have to have white. Okay. Um the, there we go. There's a pig. There uh, are monarchs that look, excuse me, there are butterflies that look similar that are orange or black and white. But they're not monarchs. Okay. But they're not monarchs. There are things called viceroys. And we also have other species in Utah that have orange and black on them, but they don't have the very kind of refined border of white polka dots and that brilliant orange. And if you see the body of a monarch, you see how there are white polka dots on the body itself. Some of the other ones that kind of resemble them don't have that. Now. To be honest, there are only 3,000 monarchs in all of the Western US right now. Oh, okay. So I'm not, that's probably, I've never really, I don't know if I've seen one. <laughs> you probably haven't seen one for a number of years and you're unlikely to see one this year because of that. The Eastern population stays on the Eastern side of the Rocky Mountains. So the ones we would see in Utah are the ones that are so very rare that we're unlikely to see one. Uh, if you do, the whole state wants to know about it. And I'll show you the resource for being part of a community science project that oh, is cool. mapping every monarch we see in this state because um, it's critical <laughs> right now. 
Um, okay, let me give, make you dizzy and move on. Okay, so um, what time is it? I think I'm talking a lot. So I'll kind of glance to this one, but we'll, we'll talk about pollination today because that's my focus, right? Pollinator conservation. But I just wanted to throw out there the reality that insects in general are important for all kinds of reasons that impact us. They impact, yes, the production of our, our food, but there are food webs that we are also reliant upon that we're not directly eating like the raspberries and blueberries and almonds from, but that are supporting the other creatures that we do eat. <laughs> They're also in, integral to just the energy flow of an ecosystem. And it doesn't matter what the ecosystem is, if it's in the mountains or in the desert or in the, the prairies, they're integral to all of that. Um, we don't have soil development. We don't have organic matter decomposition unless we have insects. Um, a lot of the wildlife we see on the landscape are very dependent, not only on eating insects, but eating the food that uh, is only produced because of insect pollination. So don't ignore your insects. Don't be afraid of them. It's fun to start paying attention to them and re realizing like the diversity of insects we spend our, our time with. Even in urban systems, even here in Salt Lake City and in your housing, you'll once you start looking, you'll see tons of different kinds of insects. Um, but I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about pollination. Um, because that's what we're here for. <laughs> and the, the reality is that we have, you know, 380,000 or so different species of plants. The vast majority of those require an animal to carry pollen from one flower to the next, or they cannot set seed for that next generation of plants. Most of them are these, most of the world's are bees, and I'll talk a little bit about why that is and why they're so important. Um, unfortunately, when we look at different systems, again, all over the, the global landscape, we're finding different ecosystems are showing, and different plant species are showing a sign of what's called pollinator limitation, meaning they can't fully produce the normal number of seeds for that next generation because not enough pollinators are visiting them. And that impacts our agricultural systems as well as our natural ecosystems. So it's we got to talk about this and do something about it on a broad global scale. Um, there are about 200,000 different species of animals that act as pollinators. Um, the vast majority of those are insects, bees, beetles, ants, wasps, butterflies, moths. Um, but bees are it. Bees are the ones that pollinate 80% of, of uh, the world's plants. Just a tiny little like half a percentage is by all those other things combined. And someone in, in the audience had um, asked about yellow jackets and paper wasps and things like that. Do I, are they pollinators? Do I need to protect them or can I kill them? <laughs> they are not generally good pollinators. Um, and they are aggressive. And we aren't really compatible with them living in our spaces, especially where they might sting our kids or our pets. So I do not deter people from putting up those yellow jacket catchers. Those yellow jacket catchers and, and wasp catchers and even the things you know like fly catchers, they're generally using a hormone that is only attractive, a pheromone I should say, that's only attractive to that, that group of insects and won't harm bees. So go right ahead, hang those yellow jacket catchers up. That's just fine. I don't want them on my porch or in my backyard either. Um, those are the, those wasps tend to be predators and scavengers, uh, and and not visiting plant species and pollinating. Though there are other wasp species that do serve as pollinators. There are things we call flower wasps, but they're they're not as common as bees, and they're not even as efficient at pollinating as bees are. Um, and there are some a few birds and bats and other small mammals that will pollinate plants, but Again, 199,000 of the <laughs> pollinators are insects and of that, the vast majority are bees. And so what makes bees so important? That, well, they, they are the most ecologically important group of pollinators because they co-evolved with flowering plants to carry pollen back to their nest. And they, they evolve this very particular behavior where they go from flower to flower to flower of the same species 
on the way back to their nest, which is where they're going to feed that collected pollen and nectar to their developing eggs. So they, they're actively trying to coat their bodies with pollen and they have some really cool adaptations to that. If you look at the picture on the bottom right, that is a bee species and look at all the pollen on her. Her entire underbelly is covered with pollen, her legs, even her head is covered in pollen. Um, and she's gonna go to that next species of that same cone flower and drop some of that pollen as she's packing new pollen onto her. And that is what the flowers need in order to have fertilized seeds for that next year of, um, of plants. And they might, they might visit a hundred flowers on just one foraging trip to go collect that pollen and nectar. So they're just amazing. Butterflies don't do that. Beetles don't do that. And I'm showing a monarch here. You can see the monarch has a few little grains of pollen stuck on her proboscis, but she's sipping the nectar and she is not intentionally carrying pollen anywhere. Bees are intentionally carrying pollen. And that pollination process is essential for us to survive. Uh, all of the natural ecosystems in the world, except for maybe the Antarctic ice sheets, are dependent upon pollinators for those plants that support all of the other layers of the food web as you go up. It is also essential for our agricultural production. $550 billion in global agricultural crops every single year are dependent upon pollinators, primarily insects. And then there's other things like biofuels and medicines and like the alfalfa that we feed our, our livestock and then we eat the cows, beeswax even for all kinds of things that we use industrially and, and for hobbies, all essential, all because of it, bees primarily. So bees, bees, bees. And I talk, that's why I talk so much about bees and not as much about moths and wasps. So here are the primary causes of decline among all insect pollinators. This can also apply in many cases to things like hummingbirds that pollinate. Um, habitat loss, that's the number one thing. And when I'm talking about habitat for bees, there are two things, where they lay their eggs and what they eat. So um, breeding habitat and foraging or food habitat. And we can provide both of those things in our, our urban garden spaces for sure, easily, cheaply, and it actually makes our landscapes more beautiful. Global climate change, again, um, that's a bugaboo. It's a bigger and more complex issue, but we can, we can help with that too. Again, reducing our carbon footprint, but also providing rich pollen and nectar friendly habitat in our garden spaces. Because what's happening is that as temperatures increase and precipitation patterns become less predictable, the cues that bees use to hatch for when their particular plant species are available for pollen and nectar are getting kind of out of whack. Um, and, and it's causing both the plants to not be pollinated very efficiently and the bees to not find food when they are hatching. And the average adult bee lives for about a month, one month. And then the whole rest of the year, they're developing as an egg or larvae in a nest. So if that one month doesn't contain adequate food, then you can see that's a problem. Um, just like the Averomite, there are other introduced parasites um, that's causing problem for some bees. Pesticides, again, I feel like I've talked about that enough. And then in some cases, there might be some competition with exotic po pollinators, often the ones that we've brought over um, that outcompete our native bees for food. Okay, so that's kind of it about the scary, oh my gosh, the world's going to hell in a handbasket kind of stuff. Um, it's more fun now to just talk about the diversity of bees. So, um, but if you do have questions about some of those other detrimental impacts on, on bees and pollinators, do let me know. Okay, so we got this, we know this is a honeybee. That's the first picture I, I showed at the beginning of the talk, but these are all bees too. Look at them. Are they not beautiful? <laughs> And in some cases, excessively cute. Look at this little flying fuzzball here. They're so hairy. And you can see these hairs that they co-evolved to pack pollen into. Um, and then look at this flying jewel. It's like this beautiful, deep, rich, purpley blue. That's a mason bee. Um, this green one here, that's actually on a nest box I have on my back porch. I took that picture um, when she just hatched and she looks like a 
you know, a flying jewel. And then this itty bitty tiny little bee, that's my finger. She just landed on my bee. This is a tiny little fairy bee. Um, they're diverse in size, in color, in uh, the shapes that they present themselves. Um, some nest in the ground, some nest in cavities, but none of these bees um, have a, a lifestyle similar to honeybees. And I'll talk about that a little bit. Okay, these are things that are not bees. They kind of look like bees, but they're not. This in the lower left is a fly. It's yellow and black, but it's not a bee. This in the upper right is also a fly, yellow and bat black, but not a bee. And then I think you recognize the wasps here, paper wasps. Now you'll see a wasp occasionally on a flower. They will munch on pollen sometimes when they can't find the meat that they would rather eat. But um, you can see that they're not fuzzy and hairy and they're not packing pollen onto their bodies. And then you've probably seen this big globular paper thing in some trees. Um, that's not a beehive, that is a bald-faced hornet's nest. And you don't want to mess with them. They will, they will sting you. <laughs> so leave those things alone. Uh, and um, usually they're not really bothersome to us anyway. So how do you know that you're looking at a bee? Um, there are some very specific things. One is if it's fuzzy, super fuzzy, it's, it's a bee. One is you look at their wings. You can see the, the fly I'm circling here. They have one pair of wings and they don't really overlap when they're at rest. But if you look at the two bee picture, well, actually really just this green bee, you can see when they're at rest, their wings overlap kind of in a straight line parallel to their back. If you look at a fly, you can hardly see their antenna. They have very in obvious antenna. Bees always have antenna that you can very easily see the wasps do as well. So if you, if you can't tell between wasp and a bee at this point, you look to their eyes. Wasps have little beady black eyes. Bees, the, the two on the right here, they have kind of oval or comma shaped eyes. And a fly's eyes, stop it, stop it, oh my goodness. A fly's eyes, this middle one here, make up its entire head. Like if you see an insect and the whole head is eyeballs, that's a fly. Even if it's yellow and black and kind of fuzzy. And then the only things carrying pollen, actively carrying pollen, are bees. So if you see like this bee in the far right, it's little underbelly, the abdomen completely coated with yellow pollen. It's a bee and it's a female. Only the female bees carry pollen to provision their babies with food. So um, honeybees are kind of this weird exception to the rule, believe it or not, even though honeybees are more well known and we see them more often. They, they have large numbers, but they have a weird lifestyle. All of the other, so there are seven species of honeybees in the world and 19,993 or so species of bees that are not honeybees in the world and none of them produce honey and they don't produce beeswax and they don't these, live in these big social hives with tens of thousands of individuals. The, the more likely bee you're apt to see are some little cute fuzzy bees that live in the ground that you only see active for a month of the year. The, you, you know, you probably learned about in elementary school science that, you know, the way honeybees live, there's a queen, she lays somewhere around a thousand to fifteen hundred eggs every single day in that hive to maintain that huge honeybee hive. It takes about three weeks for those eggs to develop into a worker and it constantly is perpetuating that honeybee hive year round. Honeybees don't die off in the winter. They just hibernate in their hives. Again, a couple tens of thousands of them still in the hive staying there. Um, but all of the other bees, we call them solitary bees because most bees in the world are hanging out doing their own thing. A female and male will hatch in the spring. They'll mate. The male will then die. The female will then spend another couple of weeks laying eight to 20 eggs or so, provisioning each single egg with a pollen nectar ball. You can see here that bottom picture, there's a little tiny egg on a, like a glossy ball of pollen mixed with nectar. And then for 10 or 11 months, that little thing just hangs out in a cavity, either in a ground or in a hollow branch or something developing until the next spring. Very simple, not complex social systems at all which is usually mind blowing to people. They're like, I'm sorry, what, what did you just say? 
totally different from the paradigm we have commonly in our heads. Um, there's one slight exception, bumblebees, which there are about 30 different species of bumblebees in the Western US, uh, 50 in all of the United States. We call them semi-social. Um, and there is a queen, but the biggest a bumblebee colony will get is a, like 200 or so individual workers. Um, and they all die for the winter. The only one that hibernates for the winter is the new queen for that next year. Um, and so I'll, I'll let you know of some cool habitat components you can provide in your gardens that will attract those hibernating queen bumblebees because they're really fun to have. When in you garden. say a uh, new queen, like how does that get decided? <laughs> I think I'd have another slide. Yeah, here we go. So oh, um, okay. yeah, so the bumblebee life cycle is just a little different. So the, the previous queen will lay some eggs that the workers feed the proper provisions to, to create a new queen. And so they'll be developing three to five new queens in the fall. And once those queens are mature and leave the nest, the workers and that year's queen of that colony dies off. Those new, we call them, this is all very like Game of Thrones. The new virgin queens <laughs> go out on their nuptial flight and mate with males. And then they store that sperm in their bodies and never mate again. And then the next spring when they emerge from their little hibernation den, they quickly start a new nest of workers. So if in like March or April, you're seeing bumblebees, you're seeing the big girls, like the big queens, and then sh they'll quickly start laying eggs of new workers. Um, and they're pretty cute. This is what a bumblebee nest looks like, kind of this funny globule waxy nest, but you know, this big, <laughs> as opposed to the size of a honeybee hive. And I had a bumblebee nest in my backyard last year. It was really exciting. Okay, any, any kind of questions about the lifestyles of bees? I'm gonna talk about the, just the few kinds of bees you can see in Utah in your gardens next. Okay, so the most common bees you'll, you'll likely see here in your gardens are mining bees. And they're just called that because they nest in the ground. They're all solitary, they're all cute and fuzzy. They often emerge pretty early in the spring and you can tell they're mining bees because they carry pollen on their, their legs and kind of under their thorax there. Um, this is what they look like, just a little hole in the ground, like kind of like an anthill without any ants. Um, and if you're lucky, you'll see the female coming and going for that two or three weeks where she's actively laying eggs in there, a total of maybe like eight to 16 eggs. So it's not like some huge ground nesting yellow jacket colony that's gonna have hundreds of stinging nasties. The next common one you'll likely see are mason bees or leaf cutter bees. These are the ones that live in those nest boxes you may have seen for sale at Costco or Lowe's or wherever else. You can also make your own nest boxes, which I have done on, these are from my porch, the ones showing in the lower right. Um, you may also have seen on campus that the Beekeepers Association installed observation native bee nest boxes at the Edible Campus Gardens, as well as at our Pollinator Conservation Garden in front of the College of Architecture. Uh, you can do it, I'll show you how to do it, super easy. Um, and it's really fun to attract these cute little mason bees to your yard. They carry pollen under their belly. They tend to have like pretty big proportional heads and jaws because they're cutting uh, leaves and uh, carrying dirt back to the soil to plug up their little nest holes where they're laying eggs. This is a little male mason bee on my hand here. Look at that little fuzzy wuzzy. He's like a flying teddy bear. He's so cute and he has this little white mustache. I, that's my favorite time of year is March when these guys are uh, emerging. And there, you might've heard of them because they're, because they live in these portable cavities, you can carry them around orchards to help with your pollination. And that's, that's happening on a commercial basis now. Uh, another one you're very likely to see, we call sweat bees. They might land on you and lap up a little bit of salty sweat on your skin. Again, extremely gentle. Never, I mean, unless you're squeezing them hard, they're not going to sting you. Um, they just don't care. They don't, they don't have honey that they're protecting. They don't have this hive full of 50,000 babies that they need to guard, right? So they just didn't evolve to be aggressive. They're very gentle. Um, 
And they carry pollen on their upper legs. You can see it really clearly here, this, these white pollen grains here on the legs. But this is one of my favorite bees, the metallic green sweat bee in the lower right corner, just a flying emerald. They're gorgeous. And you see them in all of May. So they're kind of done now. And then a few other kinds of bees. If you're kind of hiking in a wetland area, you might see polyester bees. They're really well adapted to nesting in wet soils because they actually line their cavities with a little bit of this. It's almost like spider silk in the form of saran wrap. <laughs> they'll, they'll lay around the, the outside of those cavities to prevent the water and you know, moisture from attracting fungus and bacteria. They're really cute. And then the last kinds of bees that you're really familiar with, it, it's the family that includes carpenter bees that we talked about early, bumblebees, honeybees, and then some of my favorite bees called longhorn bees. If you look at this upper right picture, look at how long those antenna are. They're almost length of the body. They're just extremely cute. And they have this endearing habit of sleeping in sunflowers at night, the males do that. So here's a picture of males sleeping in a sunflower in my front yard. You can see their really long antennas against the petals. Um, in August and September on a kind of a cool late summer morning, go look to a sunflower and you'll invariably find male longhorn bees sleeping in them. They're just so cute. Um, any questions about these guys? I, I know I already kind of covered the carpenter bees early. Okay, let's talk now about um, how, to, how to build our gardens to be safe and friendly for pollinators. Um, the best way to do this is to have a diverse landscape, diverse in plants, but also diverse in substrates. So um, bunch grasses, that's often where a uh, hibernating queen bumblebee will hole up for the winter. So nice big stout bunch grasses are great. The native flowering plants, at least native to like the Intermountain West or Great Basin are great for the bees that adapted to feed off of them, all of our native solitary bees. You want flowers that bloom from March all the way through late October because you're gonna get all the different varieties and species of bees that hatch throughout the summer. Again, each bee as an adult of this solitary native bees lives for about a month, but they're different months. Some hatch in April, some hatch in July, some don't hatch until August. So the, the whole range of the growing season is covered. Then, the, and that kind of takes for of the uh, care of the foraging habitat. When you're talking about breeding habitat and allowing bees to actually have their little nests, um, leaving bare soil is the cheapest, easiest way to provide breeding habitat for these little solitary bees. About three quarters of the world's bees just nest in the ground. And so don't mulch everything necessarily, leave some, leave just a square foot of bare soil and you will find that native bees um, hatch from them, which is fantastic. Rock, kind of rocky walls and piles in your landscaping will also attract ground nesting bees and then hanging a nest box, which can be holes drilled in wood um, or like a bundle of hollow reeds or sticks. You can just for all I care, wrap them with string and hang them somewhere protected, or you can have a cute little house that you jam them in. A variety of diameter openings and lengths is great to attract different species of bees. And then the way to make them safe after you've provided these habitat components is to be really judicious with your pesticide use or don't use it at all, specifically insecticides, though some of the other herbicides and fungicides aren't great for bees either. And then talk about it, like share this information um, with, with everyone in your life. <laughs> the more we talk about it, the more people that are aware of this, the more likely we'll have um, uh, an impact, a positive impact on our pollinators. I'm going to share these slides in a PDF with you so you don't have to write this down, okay. but this is specific directions for building a native bee nest box. And again, you can buy these elsewhere, but you can very cheaply make them yourself. Um, and so no worries, I'll, I'll get this information to you. And in the bottom here, the xerces.org, that, this is where I've gotten this information. So you can also go to their website. Okay, now, what are you gonna plant in your gardens? I mean, pretty much anything beautiful. <laughs> um, but there are some bulbs and annuals that you can plant here that'll survive, but aren't quite as good for our native solitary bees or even for honeybees. So here's a great plant list. 
any cactus species if you're doing a xeriscape is great. Um, you can also find kind of Intermountain West native flowering species. Generally, those are also going to be a thing to prioritize. And then some things like penstemon, like that's just bee catnip right there. They love any penstemon species. They love the, the pea family, so milk vetches uh, and, and astragalus and that kind of stuff. They love the sunflower family, so any kind of sunflower, but also cone flowers are fantastic, as well as um, goldenrod, things like that. Um, and then don't forget the bunch grasses. But again, bunch grasses not only serve as potential hibernation spots for bumblebees, but they, they often will provide an early source of pollen if they're a, a cold season bunch grass for those bees that are emerging early and wanting to munch on pollen. And pollen is basically the po a protein source for bees, whereas nectar is the carbohydrate source for a bee diet. There are also some shrubs you can plant that are really beautiful. Fern bush is one of my favorites. It's leaves, uh, they're very fern-like and, and beautiful and they exude this smell that's similar to honey. Um, blue spirea, that's what's shown here. I, that's my favorite shrub. I have four of those just on the boulevard in front of my house because they're this intense purpley blue. Um, native shrubs like rabbit brush and antelope bitter brush and Oregon grape, all fantastic for, um, for shrubs for bees and other pollinators. Like hummingbirds also like desert willow, which we show here too. And then if you're lucky enough someday to own a house and want to plant a tree, consider a pollinator friendly tree like lindens, willows, choke cherries, service berries. That's a, a wonderful native uh, kind of smaller tree we have here. And then kind of any of the flowering things in the rose family, plums, cherries, crab apples, peaches, etc. cetera. Um, you'll have a better crop of um, fruit if you, in addition to plant the fruit trees, you also have some nesting habitat like a native bee nest block for orchard bees. They're gonna get you more fruit that way. All right, so yeah, I talk about bees a lot. Bees are the most important and efficient and ecologically relevant pollinator, but we also like our butterflies, right? Monarchs, yeah, but we also have another 200 or so species of butterflies in our state. Um, Many of them swallowtails, which are just those eye-catching, gorgeous, large one, including the black swallowtail shown here and the two-tailed swallowtail. They love milkweeds too. So don't just attract monarchs, but attract these other butterfly species as well. Um, and again, I mentioned that on that xerxesociety.org website, they just published a list of the 200 best plants to put in your yard for butterflies. So um, check that resource out. And then I love birds too. I go birding all the time. I love seeing hummingbirds in my yard. And there are some things you can mix in with your kind of bee friendly plants that are very specific to hummingbirds. They love long red tubular flowers. So like a red penstemon or hummingbird trumpet, Zoshneria, that's a fantastic xeriscape friendly, hummingbird friendly plant to have in your gardens. And you know, you might be growing primarily crops, right? Like tomatoes and whatnot. Anything in the mint family, bees love and hummingbirds will also visit. Um, and those are, you know, nice herbs that you can put in. But you can also sprinkle these other kinds of perennials and pollinator friendly plants in amongst your, your crops. And if you're growing tomatoes, they're most effectively pollinated by bumblebees. So all the better, right? Um, and then how to get involved if you're if this is something you're really interested in and you'd love to help with the conservation of pollinators beyond planting your wonderful gardens, all kinds of things you can be part of. The Utah pollinator pursuit is specific to bumblebees and monarchs in Utah. Um, Bumblebee watch, it's just, it's kind of like Pokemon Go, but for bumblebees that you actually see a real animal in life and you record the information of that. There's the Western Monarch Mapper. There's also the Salt Lake City Green Program. You can get a little sign that says basically like this is a pesticide free yard and I commit to protecting pollinators. So cool stuff like that. And that is the conclusion of, of my talk. So I'm happy to ask questions. Oh, look, I did it. It's one o'clock exactly. <laughs> that was awesome. Um, you're going to send us the slides, you said. Right? I am. I'm going to okay. say this is a PDF and send them to you. Okay, so I'm going to send it out to all the gardeners so oh, good. Um, they can like watch it or uh, scan through your slides. Perfect. And then you said some things that I'm like, I want to apply that like 
even maybe just planting more mint, like you said, or like the flowering sage in our herb garden. Just like yes. I'm trying to think of ways to make our community garden more bee friendly. Yes. Um, and maybe yes. even like spreading that info next year to the gardeners so that they can do things in their own plots, possibly. For sure. Yeah. Okay. Like, well, I had no idea. Like, I just didn't even realize that, like, anyway, it's very. No rare. one does that. And that's why I love doing it, this outreach. You know, my. My master's degree was so focused on pollinator biology, and that's where I learned it. But most people are, aren't getting this information anywhere else, and no. that's why I'm happy to talk to anybody and everybody about it. Really cool. So you bet. So yeah, if if nothing else, put a bunch of different mint species in your in your gardens. Yeah, rosemary, okay. comfrey, yeah. oregano, thyme, of course, sage. Right. Yeah, all so of we it. have a lot of that. And then I even thought it might be cool for me to make some of those nesting boxes and like put them in various spots yeah. in the in the garden so absolutely so um do you know what phragmites is no so if you go to any of the wetlands basically along the jordan river you'll okay. see this large reed growing right along the shores okay it's actually an invasive species that the county and the city are trying to control and they've given me broad permission to tell everyone to go and harvest that because they're hollow and they have these little joints right so you cut it at the joint and then have a six inch tube of hollow perfect oh, nesting habitat really cool okay yeah and you can just bundle those up and put them in like a tupperware or whatever yeah. as long as one of the ends is blocked okay. and the other end is hollow okay. and it's five or six inches deep that's perfect for a cool. large variety. That's really awesome. And it's free, right? Yeah. Okay, I love that. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, and you need no power tools. You just need like nippers, <laughs> scissors or something. Okay, like clip. Yeah, okay, prune scissors. Yeah. Or something. Okay, yeah. that's really cool. Yeah. So, yay. Well, please um, also share my email if anyone has any questions later. I'm yes, so I'll share it. your email and an email to everyone. And thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. Yeah. And guess what? At two o'clock, my next meeting, I'm talking to a bunch of folks on campus to put in an interpretive sign for our pollinator conservation mm -hmm. garden. So oh, cool. Good. Yeah. My, my efforts that. aren't over. <laughs> You're doing great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks for inviting me. Really nice. Yeah. To be here. Bye, Amy. Bye bye. Ah. Oh, Taylor, I, I think you muted yourself. For the recording, I'm just going to stop it. Oh, hi. <laughs> cool.